If there's one thing we can say of humanity, it's that we are obsessed with the possibility of alien life. There are astronomers that dedicate their entire careers to the search for life beyond our planet. However, as of early 2024, we have yet to find any. There are some promising candidates within our own solar system searching the icy moons of Jupiter and Saturn, but chances are that if we're going to find alien life, we will find it on an exoplanet, a planet orbiting a star other than the Sun. In fact, the best candidates for finding life beyond Earth lie on exoplanets not too dissimilar from the Earth, similar in size, similar in temperature, and in distance from their star. To coin a phrase from Star Trek, we're looking for an M-class planet. So in this video, we're going to talk about the search for a second Earth. First off, we'll talk about how we actually find exoplanets. Then we'll talk about the biases in these methods, and then round out the video with how we will actually find an Earth-like exoplanet. There isn't just one way to find an exoplanet, so we're going to talk about a few of those methods. I don't have time to talk about all of them, so I'm going to focus on the most successful. The most intuitive way to find an exoplanet is just to take a picture of it. This is called direct imaging. The process is fairly simple. You point a telescope at a star you think might have an exoplanet around it, you take a picture, and you try and spot it. But this method is very difficult. There aren't many exoplanets detected this way. So let's talk about a slightly more successful method, the radial velocity method, or the Doppler spectroscopy method. This relies on the Doppler effect, something you've experienced in your own life any time an ambulance has gone speeding past you with its sirens on. As the ambulance is getting closer to you, the sound waves get all bunched up and they sound higher. As it's going away from you, they sound lower because the sound waves have been spread out. The same thing happens with light. As a light source is moving away from you, its light waves get spread out. They appear more red and hence are red shifted. As it moves towards you, they get called pushed together. They appear more blue and hence blue shifted. But how does this help us find exoplanets? The key is that stars move. Stars aren't pinned in place while their exoplanet orbits around them. The exoplanet's gravity pulls on the host star and makes it wobble. As it wobbles slightly towards you, its spectrum looks more blue. As it wobbles away from you, it looks more red. This wobbling Doppler shift of the star can tell us how massive the planet is and how long it takes to orbit its star. Really useful information. But while the radial velocity method is very good, it is far from the most successful exoplanet detecting method that we have. That crown goes to the transit method, and that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of this video. In principle, the transit method is incredibly simple. We wait for an exoplanet to pass in front of its star, and we measure the amount of light that it blocks. That amount of light that is blocked can then tell us what size the exoplanet is, vital for finding an Earth-sized exoplanet. In practice, this is very difficult to do. The amount of light that is blocked by an exoplanet is minuscule. But despite this, we found thousands of exoplanets this way. The vast majority of the over 5,000 known exoplanets were discovered using the transit method. The Kepler Space Telescope alone discovered more than 1,200 exoplanets, using this method. And while the transit method is very cool and clearly very effective at finding exoplanets, it has one massive issue. It's biased. Let's talk about what bias is and how it affects our search for a second Earth. Put simply, bias is a disproportionate weight in favour of or against a particular idea, group or thing. In everyday life, this can appear as biases towards great TV programs like Star Trek, or against greedy politicians that would rather care more about their mates' profit margins than the environment or normal people, and I'm getting off topic. In science, bias is a systematic thing, baked into the method of the experiment that favours a particular result or discovery. And for the transit method, there are some major ones. The first bias in the transit method is fairly intuitive. We're trying to measure how much light is blocked from the star by the exoplanet. How do we block more light? We have a bigger exoplanet. This means that the transit method is biased towards larger planets like Jupiter and Saturn than it is towards smaller planets like the Earth. It's easier to detect something that blocks out more light. But that's not the only bias to the transit method. This other bias is more nuanced, though. 
You see, you can't just measure one transit and claim you found an exoplanet. There are many reasons that stars can vary in brightness. Solar flares or star spots are two examples. The other reason is that one transit is rarely enough to be sure you've found an exoplanet. The data that we get from these telescopes observing these transits is very noisy. It's only through observing multiple transits and then combining the data from all of them, a process known as folding, where we can start to see that dip more clearly. Herein lies the problem. To be sure we found exoplanets, we need multiple transits. The bias introduced here is we're going to detect exoplanets that orbit their star and therefore transit more frequently. When you consider these two biases, this bias towards large planets and this bias towards planets that orbit closer to their star, it's hardly surprising that the most commonly detected exoplanet is a type of exoplanet called a hot Jupiter, a gas giant that orbits very close to its star. So where does this leave us in our search for an Earth-like planet? How will we find one and when? Well, I still think it's going to be with the transit method. Despite its biases, it's still the best one for finding small planets. Small planets like the Earth are not gonna be great candidates for direct imaging. They're too small and cool to be visible as thermal emission, and they're also not big enough to reflect enough light to be directly imaged. They're also not really massive enough to be detected using the radial velocity method. So assuming the transit method, how are we going to find an Earth-like exoplanet? Well, first off, we have to find an Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone around its star. The habitable zone, or the Goldilocks zone, is the range of distances from the star where liquid water could exist, where the temperature isn't too hot or too cold, it's just right. If we're looking at sun-like stars, it's going to take some time to find planets like this, because if you've got an Earth-sized planet orbiting in the habitable zone around a sun-like star, it's going to orbit its star roughly once every Earth year. So it will take multiple years to verify the existence of that planet. Now you can look at K and M type stars, smaller stars. Their habitable zones will be closer to them. So it will be easier to find planets around them. Whether planets around M type stars are even going to be habitable is another question. Make sure you subscribe because I may make a video about this in the future. Once we found an Earth-sized exoplanet orbiting in the right place, we then need to find out a bit more about it. Namely, does it have an atmosphere and does that atmosphere show any signs of life? For this, the basic transit method is not going to cut it. We need something a bit more advanced, a method called transit spectroscopy. This is an extension to the transit photometry we've been doing so far. A spectrum is what you get when you split light up into its various wavelengths by passing it through a prism. It tells you how much of each wavelength of light is being received. Different atoms and molecules will appear as different absorption lines in the spectrum, as they absorb different wavelengths of light. The spectrum of a star is sort of like its fingerprint. The same can be done with atmospheres. The light that passes through them is absorbed by the molecules that make up those atmospheres. If you did this to the Earth's atmosphere, you'd see a lot of absorption lines from nitrogen and from oxygen. This is the key to studying exoplanets in more detail. As the light from that star passes through the exoplanet's atmosphere, it will be absorbed by the molecules in that atmosphere. Once we have this combined spectrum, we can subtract the spectrum of the star on its own. What's left behind tells us what atoms and molecules make up the atmosphere of these exoplanets. This is the key to finding an Earth-like exoplanet, not just an Earth-sized one. So while the search for a second Earth is far from over, and even once we find one, we won't be able to go and visit it for a few centuries, that discovery is closer than it's ever been. We know the methods that will get us there. But truth be told, the search is far from over. If you like this sort of video where I take a piece of astronomy and show you how it's applied in real life to research, then please make sure to like this video and comment down below letting me know. Also make sure you subscribe and hit the bell icon so you're notified about future videos. If you'd like to discuss this video with other like-minded people, then please do come join us on Discord. We've got a nice little community going on over there. Link is in the description down below. There's some recommended viewing on screen now if you'd like something else to watch. And all that's left for me to say is thank you very much for watching, and I will see you in the next one. See ya.